I've pulled together some very special resources for children and youth programs based on our recent mapping of COVID resources. So we like to highlight the best. And I will put in the chat box the link to our website so you can continue uh, to either download your own resources or have access to the resources. All right, without further ado then, I will ask uh, David um, to, as moderator to, um, to take over. Thank you all again for joining. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Julie, for the introduction. Uh, so sorry for the technical inconveniences, everyone. Um, as Julie said, my name is David Imbao Hakome. I'm a medical doctor from Ecuador. I have recently joined Core Group as a knowledge management and communication advisor, uh, mostly supporting the COVID-19 response uh, and products from Core Group. So this is my first uh, webinar as part of Core Group, and the the thing that the topic is related to children and youth was very important to me because uh, for the past decade I have been working on mostly youth engagement in different platforms. So having this, this topic uh, being part also of the COVID-19 response uh, has a special place in my heart. So everyone is talking about COVID-19 right now in different uh, platforms and in different areas. Um, we are talking about, well, from the beginning of the of the pandemic, um, there was this conversation that uh, young people were not affected by it. Uh, they were not in the risk population. So at some point, children and youth were a bit less behind in the COVID-19 response. Um, however, there are many implications for children and youth, uh, including the socioeconomic consequences, uh, mental health issues, and many more that speakers will be will be presenting now. So. Uh, Without further ado, I will pass the presenters right to the first uh, speakers from UNICEF. Uh, Julie has already introduced them. Um, and just give me one second so I can give it to Shiraz. Okay. So, Shiraz, you're not a presenter. Can you move the slide? Amanda. Monday, yeah, Monday, my mock thing is. Well, that is my thing. I'm trying to move the slides, but I don't seem to be able to actually even uh, uh, burden me a second. It worked last time. Uh, I just give you a presenter's role. Yeah, yeah, it works. Move the <laughs> It, it, for some reason, it's not working. Sorry about this. Uh, it, obviously, it worked in the trial one, but in the real thing, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, okay, let me let me take a look. Sorry for this. Uh, David, maybe you can just advance the slides for him. Yeah. And then that will be. Um, yeah. Shaz, just tell us when you'd like to um, move. Yeah. It. Let's well, let's move to the first of my slides, and then I can introduce myself and um, invite Howie to introduce himself, and then I'll get going with the slides. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know why. Um, so while we get into the first slides, first I'd, I'd like to um, thank the core group for inviting myself and Howie to um, present. Um, we're going yeah, to be can presenting. You, can you look this? Can you see the slides now? Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see them. Uh, yeah, let's start on this one. Okay. But the way I see it is as um, as a screen rather than as a presentation. Yeah. So, um, is it better now? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and thank you, David. Maybe I'll, I'll just say when we need to move to the next slide. I only have about five slides, so it's not going to be too yeah. difficult, I don't think. So, so huge thanks to Core Group for the invitation to talk a bit about um, education, especially obviously knowing this is a health network. Um, but I think as has been said in the introduction, uh, the way that this crisis is um, um, impacting children is perhaps uh, less discussed um, and less understood in some senses. Um, and so it's great that given 
um, in the region that I cover, Eastern and Southern Africa, 21 countries, about 120 million children are now at home and not in school, that there is a, a platform to be able to talk about some of those kind of impacts. Uh, so just to quickly say, I'm an education specialist uh -huh. in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, Howie, could you quickly introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll start to go through the slides. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Awi. Uh, I'm the regional uh, business analyst for technology for development covering Western and Central Africa. Over to you, Shira. Great, thank you very much, Howie. Um, and to, to colleagues, my presentation is kind of going to be in two parts. Um, uh, the first part is going to just set out UNICEF's thinking about what should be the education response for children in the current context we're in. Um, I wanted to put that a slide in about that because this is what everyone was talking about. Uh, however, um, the second part of the slide is, was, was the reason why we were invited to come, which was talking about a toolkit that we've been developing, Howie, myself and others in UNICEF and with other partners, which is about how digital technologies can ensure effective and rele relevant learning outcomes. And so it's a slightly longer term agenda, but I wanted to make sure that we talk to you a bit about what is what is the implications of um, COVID in education and what we're doing about it. And I think many colleagues from, the, from, from, from this network and particularly from the health sector will have very interesting views about this and I'll be looking forward to the discussion. So if I can go to the next slide, David. Um, and, and actually, if you can click one more time to just bring up the image on this slide, uh, I think there was there was maybe yeah, that's great. Um, so, this is, so as I've already said, uh, this is the first part of my presentation to talk a bit about UNICEF's uh, education response in the context of COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. And in this call, we'll know about the health response. Uh, but as noted a moment ago, we have about 120 million children just in the region that I cover, um, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, that are now at home and, and um, not in schools, not in formal learning. So what is it that we're doing? So on the left-hand side of this slide is the six dimensions that we are structuring our work by. Um, I'm going to focus on the two that are um, in, in blue there. I encourage colleagues to read through this. And as, as Julie has already mentioned, the slides of this will be shared. Um, and the reason why I'll focus on the blue, because this is where we are right now. We're in a context where countries have closed schools and kids are at home. Um, and we, as educationalists, uh, are keen to ensure that learning continues and that we think about what the impact of that learning is. Uh, before I go into what the diagram is there, it is also hugely important for us to be aware that school closure raises a whole bunch of risks for kids. Um, it is obviously a health um, response uh, decision to close schools. To, to reduce the spread of the uh, of the virus, but there are many kids who are now in uh, uh, different levels of vulnerability because they're not getting school meals anymore, because they're not got in a place where they, they can have good uh, uh, hand washing facilities, because they might be in unsafe home environments, and the whole psychosocial impact of not being able to um, socialise with their with their peers is an impact. And those are some of the other things that I'm not going to dive into so much in detail with this slide. What this is about is saying, okay, those are factors and we are working with partners, social services, health services, uh, communication for development, nutrition provision services to ensure that the other risks are mitigated. But what are we doing about ensuring that kids continue to learn? And we broadly have this three three point strategy um, that we're working um, UNICEF and many other partners are working with government to try and implement. Um, so the first, obviously, when kids are at home, you have to respond. You have to think about how are you going to continue keep learning continue, um, con continuing. And we have, I've, I've created this kind of three cog um, diagram uh, to illustrate that there's three parts that are very much interlinked. And, and frequently, these three parts, uh, some, some parts are overemphasized than others, but it's important that all are, are, have equal importance. 
and, and really we say to, 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 to education providers, whether they're government, civil societies or private sector, that you need to be thinking of all three. And they are, you've got to have distance contents, and obviously those can be done through radio, TV, online apps, to SMS, to phone calls, whatever it might be. But delivering the content that normally would be delivered by a teacher, you need to find a new way of doing that. Um, and obviously that needs to be dependent on the household technology, prevalent household technology. And in, in the regions that Harry and myself cover in sub-Saharan Africa, um, online learning is not the primary um, medium. Um, second is actually to provide and ensure that young people have the materials that they are used to using in their learning context, workbooks, toys, stationary textbooks, uh, and in many cases, those um, we need to think hard about how those can still be distributed in a context of lockdown. The third is, and potentially the most critical, but one of the least thought through, um, is around how do we activate the range of community actors to be learning facilitators. So clearly, Many of you on this call are currently um, learning facilitators. Those of you who have school-age kids will be doing homeschooling right now. So parents, caregivers are at the front line of learning facilitators. But how do we also activate older siblings, obviously teachers, other community health workers, other people who can be engaged in communicating with parents with some key messages about um, uh, trying to keep learning going? So that's about a quick response. The second part is about saying, okay, get your response in place. It's not going to be perfect at the get-go. So we need to monitor, learn, and improve over time as things go with, with a few kind of headline bullets about one, integrating the three cogs about at the top of the slide. Um, uh, um, second is about... Um, um, uh, second is about improving the service over time for the most marginalised and recognising the marginalised are the least likely to be able to, 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 to cope in a distance learning context. And uh, collecting data that can inform um, what you need to do when schools start to open up again. And so that leads to the third area of our um, work, which is about planning for reopening. Um, and, and here we... Uh, are wanting to learn from some of the experiences from the West African, Western African Ebola crisis where we knew that many of the most vulnerable kids never came back to school. So we need back to school strategies that can uh, be inclusive. We need to, when kids come back to school, understand where they, what, what's happened during the time they're away so that we give them the appropriate targeted catch up accelerated programs and also mental health and psychosocial and other support and health support um, that ensures that they're ready to learn and, 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 and get back into learning when, when and the school closures entered, ended. The final part of our kind of building, um, um, uh, opening up better schools is about actually how we build that better. So we have uh, 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 recommendations and support to government to say it may be important to reduce barriers of re-entry to school for certain communities. Can we provide cash transfers? Can we provide other incentives to ensure that families do send their kids back, even though it might be a three, four month or whatever it might be, um, gap in their learning? Um, can we have a, particularly for those of us working in many of the sub-Saharan Africa countries where online learning has not been the option for distance learning for school closures, can we change that dynamic? Um, we compare countries that I work with with, say, East Asian um, and European countries where uh, distance education, whilst difficult, has been relatively straightforward because every household has or well, most households have internet and sufficient devices. Can we bring that um, as part of a new way of um, having uh, uh, education um, supported in, in, in the countries that we work in? So 
can all schools be digital hubs? And I think we'll be looking to see a lot of advocacy of that over the future. And finally, can we use this moment where we put a lot of effort and are putting a lot of effort to activate community actors, parents, caregivers, older siblings as learning support to kids. Can we keep that as something going forward, knowing that 75% of the learners' um, uh, 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 time is outside of school? So that's about what we're doing now. I now need to, want to completely switch gears. Still obviously talking about education, but now specifically talking about education and technology. And David, if I wonder if, I wonder if you can switch to the next slide. Um, because what we've been developing pre-COVID and that we're continuing to develop in this context and we'll be looking to really work on in the future is how do we support a range of stakeholders think more about how to use technology to support learning. And we think this COVID context is a particular accelerator moment. So the, the story over the, over the history of EdTech, education technology, technology to support education, is that it is a high cost and low impact. Um, it, may, it doesn't have the same record of technology in the health sector. And our question that we face is how can we ensure that education technology is better deployed for learning? David, to the next slide. So what we did is that we, UNICEF, across Eastern and Southern Africa and Western Southern Africa worked with Innovation Union, which is a social think tank based out of the UK, and the Aga Khan Foundation, a global organization that many of you will know, to explore that question. How can we, what are the challenges, what is going on about um, the high cost, low impact reality of EdTech? A lot of um, ambition, a lot of hope, but not a lot of um, results. Um, and, and, and really what we found is is, is that um, uh, frequently technology is deployed in education contexts with the technology in mind, not the goal in mind. Not what is it we're trying to do for learners? What are we, is it we're trying to do for teachers? How is it that we're trying to improve learning outcomes for, for young people? And so we created some research, and the link is there for all to, to see at the bottom of this slide, and I'm not going to go through all these 10 dimensions. But we developed this uh, research analysis, which generated basically 10 questions that any actor should be asking um, before they invest in technology for learning. Uh, so David, if I can go to the next slide. Um, and, 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 and what this raised was that there was lots of thinking that needed to be done to help school level, sub-national level, national, regional, and even global level actors who are working in the education environment using technology to think hard about how they are going to use technology uh, to support learning. And what, we've been, what we've now developed, and we've just kind of produced our first draft of the tool, is a human-centered design toolkit that takes any actor from school level to national um, policy level, thinking hard about what is it would make sense as an investment strategy for technology for learning. What you have here is a very complex slide, and I don't want to take you through this, um, but, but it's to just unpack that we have taken these 10 big questions and taken it, built a toolkit that takes people through a process. And David, if I can go to the next slide to help people walk through this in a much simplified, simplified way. Quite simply, it's a, it's a tool um, that thinks, helps actors to think hard about uh, 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 this orange box on the left the context that they're working in and that how ICT could support that context in terms of education and learning. So the questions it's asking is, do we know our resources, capabilities and needs with respect to ICT for learning? What are the skills levels of teachers and students? What ICT do we have? Um, who are the facilitators and partners? These are fairly straightforward questions, but questions that are not frequently being asked um, when technology is being deployed. Uh, there's a range of tools that help answer those, qu those questions and others. And that leads to a scorecard, um, which helps any actor think across the, the level of um, capability and status and, 
uh, of, of that uh, uh, sector, the education sector, um, across student, teacher, government and ecosystem level that gives them a guide about which of the areas where technology might be able to support the most, where are the biggest gaps. The idea of them going from that school cloud is to then be able to develop plans and proposals which would then be stress tests. I think there's, a, there's a number of different proposals about how you can stress test and there's a number of different tools around that to, to make sure that one doesn't just make a plan and deliver it, but to really actually start to understand how um, um, uh, the, the efficacy of those plans might be. Uh, once it, the, the stress test and that's evaluated, the idea is that you build an investment plan and implement. Now, this, this, we, we see this toolkit that can be done in a week or it could be done over three months or six months, depending on the level of the, uh, the actor. Is it school level or is it, or is it uh, national level? And depending on the scale of the investment. If you're spending billions, you want to spend a few months on doing this process. If you're, if you're adding a few different technologies to a school, you can do it in a much shorter time. If you're thinking about technology in the context of technology for education in the context we're in now and you need to react quickly, you could do it really quickly. David, if I can move to the next slide. And so, yeah. come and come Charlotte, to me. If I can ask you to wrap up, please, quickly, because we only have yeah. two more minutes. It, it, okay. That's Thanks. right. And this is, my last, this is my last slide before I invite Howie to, to, to speak. So now we've got the draft tool. We're really looking to partners. To, to pilot it, to make it and turn it into a, uh, um, a global public good. Uh, we're, we're speaking to a number of partners. If there's anyone in this school who's interested, you'll be able to, to reach out to me um, uh, or, or Howie to talk more about this. We want people to actually trial it. Uh, uh, and see how we can turn it into something that can add value for all. Because what's our goal? We want investments in ICT yeah. for learning to be uh, future-proof in the long term. And our concern is in the now that there is a lot of investment for technology for learning, and it, a lot of it might be um, misaligned and not directed to where need is. So let me stop there and see if Howie has got a, some final thoughts before we finish our presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shiraz. Yeah, I think just a few points. I would say there are a lot of investments that are currently going in into technology for learning. And these are used to design and deploy solutions. And I think one of the most important things that we need to consider is that while we have to respond quickly to, to the to current situation, we really need to look at how these solutions can be used in the long term sustainably to address uh, the learning needs and in the process in the resilient, uh, resilient uh, learning that can support even other strokes in, in, in the future. And I think these tools and toolkits are quite an important tool at this moment really to, to future proof of uh, any of the investments and tools that we develop. And I think I think I'm just going to give a couple of examples. I know we don't have a lot of time, but you, we know that when we talk about learning, there are quite a lot of opportunities. But at the end of the day, we need to also prioritize. The investment is significant. So one of the tools is, is, is looking at how do you prioritize learning and how do you, how do you prioritize learning as, as, as an outcome rather than technology dictating, dictating what should be, what should be uh, let's say, accessed and, and, and shared with, with students. And we also know that there are quite a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, um, risks around, around you know, access to the internet for children and their, their exposure to damaging behaviors. So one of the tools is looking at how do you, how do you support, uh, how do you identify risks and support the development of, of and mitigation of mitigation strategies. Again, also looking at the poor and marginalized, where access to digital learning is, is one of one of uh, one of uh, kind of a, a challenge. How do we, we we work with partners, whether it's private sector or or, or, or implementing partners, to come up with 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 with, with a partnership models that that can support the cost around learning? And one of the tools is really looking at uh, looking at how we we build partnership mm -hmm. and, and develop costing. So with that, I think, as, as uh, Shiraz said, and we would really, really like, we've already piloted this tool in Kenya and Cameroon as part of the development process, but we also would like to... to, 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 to something must have 
with other so, so develop a uh, global good. Excuse me, if you guys are now. not um, speaking, can you please mute your mics? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I was saying that we're looking for partners to, to further pilot this and develop it into a global uh, public good that can be used across across countries. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Howie. Thank you so much, Inisa, for your representation. There are many questions on the chat box, and I hope we will be able to address all of them during the discussion that we'll have after the next presentation. So the next presenter is Victoria Watson, Executive Director of the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning. Victoria, uh, can you hear us now? Victoria? I don't see a microphone next to her. Um, she leaned before she was speaking yeah. at the when we when we were talking. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, maybe well, in the interest of time, we can move to the discussions that were raised on the from the from the questions. Yeah, and Victoria, when you get back, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, please. So we have received um, many, many questions for, for UNICEF uh, based on your presentation, which was very, very interesting once again. So I will raise some of them. Uh, the first one is, um, we have, I'm quoting here, improving. Sorry, Victoria, was that you? No? OK. Um, so the question is, improving services over time for most marginalized. Why over time? Can the most marginalized be our first priority? Uh, please, how or Shiraz, any thoughts on this? If I can just quickly come in um, first and let, then let Howie, yes. Uh, uh, it's a great question and, and, and uh, I wish it was, it, it was, um, it was possible uh, uh, and maybe it is possible. I mean, I guess part of the thing is just to think about what UNICEF does. UNICEF is not providing services. We're working with governments and others to provide. What we're seeing governments do in a moment, and if we're honest with ourselves in an education community, we weren't ready for this crisis. We don't have, particularly in contexts where online learning is not the main model of distance learning. We just don't have the resources, we don't have the infrastructure in every household and all around the world, all around the countries to follow that model. And, and to, 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 so governments have been scrambling to a certain degree. I think doing an excellent job, I don't want scrambling to sound negative, doing an excellent job of quickly pulling together things like radio programs, TV programs. Hi everyone, this is Victoria. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can now. Thank you so much. Finally, uh, this is great. Sorry to interrupt you, Shiraz. I'm so sorry about my technological issues here. I'm not sure why it hasn't been working. Shiraz, I'll let you finish up and then we can proceed. Yeah, my maybe let, I'll just finish this question, David, and then maybe yeah. we move to Victoria because I yeah, do appreciate do that. So just on this question, because it's such a good one, is, is the government have been responding with what they have? And, and, and there's this sense, for example, that radio is a great way of getting messages out. But in fact, radio has not actually got that high level of penetration in most of the countries in our region. Um, and it would probably be much better to build up SMS systems. Uh, so so, it's, so this, this is probably the reason why let's get a response out first. Let's get, encourage governments to do and other actors to get something out. And then very quickly, with no delay, let's understand who that's impacting and then respond to the most marginalized. So over on that question, David, back Thank to you. Thank you so much, Shiraz. Uh, Victoria, the floor is yours now. Um, I'll, just let me know when you want me to pass the slide. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David, for sharing my slides. And again, apologies, everyone, for the technological issues. I'm sorry to be slowing everyone down. So, hi, just introduce myself. I'm Victoria Watson, and I'm the Executive Director for the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning. There are some of you on the call who do know us quite well, but I think they're all, most folks on the call haven't worked with us before, including some of the folks at Core Group. Um, so I'd like to give everyone a brief background first on who we are as an organization and what our focus areas are in the field of adolescent and youth health. 
So the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning is a youth-led global health organization which originated as a movement of young leaders inspired to ensure that family planning services, information, and sexual and reproductive health products, especially contracept contraceptives, were truly youth-friendly and reflective of consumer needs by enabling all young people across the world to take a lead in advancing family planning and integrated sexual, sexual and reproductive health services in their communities and become key decision makers in subnational health systems and in global policymaking. So as one of the few global organizations that exists for youth and is entirely led by youth, we operate as a network of 80 youth-led country chapters and we have a parent organization that is roughly based in Washington, D.C. And what we try to do is take a very decentralized approach um, to ensuring that young people can meaningfully and authentically lead in their communities as much as possible by aiming to reduce the barriers that usually impede their activities. So that way we can really leverage youth energy, creativity, and expertise to meaningfully improve policy implementation, advocacy, and awareness around family planning and sexual and reproductive health services. Right now, as we proceed into the post-2020 era, our organization is really taking a more comprehensive approach to family planning by focusing on the more intersectional experiences and barriers to access that young people face when accessing bodily autonomy, family planning, and trying to pursue their future aspirations from a place of equity and empowerment. And the basis of our work really lies in understanding the fundamental human right to medically accurate, equitable, and judgment-free sexual and reproductive health services and rights and products for all adolescents and young people. So as an organization representing about 80 countries of young people who lead independent youth-led chapters as a part of the Alliance, and with a membership base of over 2,500 young people globally who advance advocacy and learning and community development for family planning, it's been our priority as an organization to really respond to young people's healthcare and wellness needs during the pandemic as much as possible. And our network and geographic diversity thus far has really enabled us to act in a really meaningful way and as a coordinating mechanism for community-based agenda setting, multi-country collaboration between young leaders and civil society organizations, and as a virtual convener on adolescent youth sexual and reproductive health issues and mental health during the coronavirus pandemic. And right now, each of the young people in our country chapters across the 80 country network are really functioning as social entrepreneurs within their communities and as advocates in the policymaking spaces. Um, I see the slides are moving. Thanks, David. But if we could just go back to slide two, thanks. I'm getting the impression by the slides that you'd like me to quicken up. So I will just go back into the topic outline. Thanks. So um, I will fast forward a bit. So the scope of the presentation I've made for us today is to really showcase the innovative solutions young people across our network are leading and the unique intersectional issues and priorities young people have identified from each of their countries as the key problems impacting them as youth during the pandemic, which I believe really serves as like a call to action for the global health community to focus their attention on these needs, given the window of opportunity to improve prevention and address long-term health repercussions when we focus on adolescent youth needs, especially around sexual and reproductive health care. So moving on to slide three, I thought I'd really start off today's presentation by centering young people's voices and experiences within the scope of today's dialogue across all these amazing stakeholders. So here are two quotes that I've gathered from two of the young leaders in our network that I really think highlights the unique experiences and nature of youth and how we can work together to prevent their feelings of disenfranchisement during the pandemic. So here's a quote from Ankita where she says, Young people are just as vulnerable to COVID-19 as much as older individuals. And then from Nakambo, <laughs> sorry, I can't pronounce his name, Kambako from Malawi, he has said to me, and it's part of the youth task force, that youth in Bondi, Malawi, they are starting a lockdown and they don't have a mandate for outreach. International platforms like the one that we facilitate in these virtual spaces um, really help us, especially for rural communities who are 20 kilometers from reach of their district hospital, a supportive network and assistance to this challenge. And as youth, they don't have COVID-19 information and are really blank due to the remoteness of their community. So those are really two great quotes from the youth within our network. Moving on to slide four. 
As a part of the International Youth Alliance's response to COVID-19, we have decided to serve as a coordinator and convener of the COVID-19 Youth Task Force, given our spread, scale, and reach across 80 countries. Um, there is a lot of appetite among young people to drive change and play a leading role in their communities and use technology, advocacy, advocacy and innovative solutions to improve community-centered virus prevention and close gaps to the health needs among youth and adolescents, especially for those in rural and low resource settings. So moving on to slide five. Who are we? So we are a group of 40 plus, well now it's actually reached to 50 plus youth from across the world who have come together to develop solutions, skill share and support each other across virtual platforms. How are we operating? So as we all know, as everyone on the call knows, you are no strangers to technology and um, above all else, we have really quickly adapted, adapted and innovated um, our community organizing approaches in response to the global self-isolation requirements um, by identifying digital tools to facilitate responses and community building around mental health and SRH and to cross Paul Knight resources and tools and ideas to develop solutions and amplify community campaigns that each of them are leading. So the way this task force was born was we had this virtual peer support session that myself and a couple of other young leaders from Pakistan and Kenya organized to provide a better sense of community and again prevent a sense of disenfranchisement during the pandemic by bringing young people together into a very safe, informal, candid peer support drop-in center that happens on a weekly basis where young people can join share what they're experiencing and say, hey, this is what I need from people. This is what I want to drive forward in my community. These are the resources that I need. And as a response to those weekly peer support sessions, our COVID-19 Youth Task Force originated and each young person who was in those calls invited young people from within their subnational communities to join the task force. And now we're operating within this 50 plus youth scope um, and include 11 countries thus far. And you can see a map of our reach in the next slide. So as you can see, we have a lot of young people from across the world. Um, now moving on to the next slide. Thanks, David. And um, one of the things we did first as a task force during our first peer support session was to really identify the context specific intersectional issues facing young people in each of their countries. Right now, there's been a huge gap in governmental response to what young people need. Um, there hasn't been youth-friendly information provided by governments in relation to the COVID-19 prevention policies. Um, young people have been marginalized to their homes. They feel disconnected from their friends, their social group, their social support system. They can't go to school. So as a result of those multivariable issues that have come into play um, and have now impacted their lives, a slew of priorities were raised from across the task force um, that young people thought were urgent and required action. So if we move on to the next slide, David. Okay, I'm seeing lots of questions come up, so let's leave those to the end. This slide, I wanted to give a pretty clear picture of the gradient of issues that were raised by young people in the task force. And I've organized it by mental health, gender equity, vulnerability, and access to sexual and reproductive health services and products. And so here you can see the breakdown of priorities and issues that young people raised from across the scope of our youth task force from each of their 11 countries. And I really want to start off with mental health because I think this really frames everything that we're experiencing right now, right? Is this feeling of isolation and despair and, and young people are most vulnerable to these feelings because they've suddenly been removed from school, their, their communities, and a lot of them are feeling a loss of empowerment because they're suddenly at home and they're facing a lot of traditional roles and norms that they didn't always have to interact with when they went to school and engaged in all the programming that was provided to them outside of their homes. So something that has been brought up by young people in the task force um, as key priorities is access to telecounseling so that young people have a discrete, confidential platform and pathway to guidance and advice so that way they don't feel as alone and isolated to their own feelings and trapped while at home. 
Other issues are surround themselves in regarding maintaining friendships, occupational well-being, and being unable to pursue their future aspirations by being stuck at home and having no sense of future and having so much uncertainty, and then facing a lot of chronic depression and a loss of hope do this disconnect between their future aspirations and their plans for the future um, around school and occupational training. They've also raised a lot of concerns around access to contraceptives and then flowing from that unintended pregnancies and the intimacy that happens. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm seeing, seeing some comments from Jill saying, please show more solutions. We are aware of the many problems. Okay, thank you for that feedback. I will move on to the next slide. Moving on to the uh, next thank slide. You, thank you, for that. Jill. Please, uh, if you can wrap up in one more minute so we can yep. also get, address sure. these, these uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So youth-led action. What are youth around the world doing to take action and support their communities? Moving on to the next slide. Great. So one of our task force members um, is running an advocacy and counseling support campaign in Kenya. Um, this person is named Eric Omandi and he leads Generation Guiders, um, a community-based organization. Um, and what they're doing through Generation Guiders is calling for renewed action within their community, within their health system, and across community stakeholders to provide life-saving sexual and reproductive health services for the most vulnerable, especially adolescent girls. The campaign that he's launched through the task force is providing counseling as well um, using a free SMS platform, so texting, to engage adolescent girls in rural areas in Kenya um, so that they have access to discreet confidential advice from any phone. So that's one of the solutions that came up from one of our task force members in Kenya. Next slide, in Malawi, um, a young gentleman named Happy at one of the task force members in Mpinela, Malawi, organized youth community members to introduce a local hands-free washing tool as a solution to preventing virus spread in rural Malawi because there were a lack of interventions in his community. So we thought that this tool that he and his other peers organized would provide a very low cost and accessible inter intervention that could be scaled across the country. And as a part of implementing this service um, and introducing this intervention to his community, the members of his group also shared key locally specific COVID-19 information so that their community members could all know the measures that they have been put in place to prevent the virus and what they can do to take, um, to take action and support people around them. And the group has also started training peers within the community so they can continue the project and spread awareness because, again, they really want to close that gap um, in COVID-19 information that's accessible and user-friendly for rural communities in Malawi, like one of the first quotes highlighted. And if you go on to the next slide, you can see that solution come into play. Right there is the hands-free hand washing brought by Happy in the task force, which is really great. It's cheap, it's effective, and young people can implement it within their community safely by distance. Moving on to the next slide. In Pakistan, Saro Imran, one of the IYP country coordinators, um, has been disseminating youth-friendly COVID-19 guidance and awareness communications digitally, which she has shared across her country network to ensure that young people have information that is actually relevant to their needs and experiences, because a lot of young people don't only need the medical information or the prevention information, but they need information that makes them have a sense of hope and a feeling of connectivity to their friends and their social group, and to help them maintain their identity um, and their their ways of connecting to people who they engaged with in schools and outside of their homes. Um, so the campaign really focuses on home, mental health, friendships, and personal health, and how to make informed choices for your sexual and reproductive health services. The unique thing, especially around this campaign that Saro created, is that she has been really focusing on translating these tools and awareness campaigns to transgender youth across Pakistan. She herself identifies as transgender, and she's been a longstanding activist in this field, and she recognized that transgender youth are particularly marginalized during this era because of the stigma and senses of a Depression that they face while at home and the lack of support that they have access to now that they are forced to stay at home with their families. So she was really driven to take action in this way to provide these youth-friendly, relevant, and engaging materials that could be disseminated digitally to make sure that transgender youth across Pakistan would feel connected and could engage with her and provide peer support to one another from their homes. Moving to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, Victoria, I'm going to have to, to, to finish now. 
Okay. Because Thanks, uh, we need to right. we need to also finish other presentation. But I hope that some of your 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 slides will be addressed during the, the discussion. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Absolutely. So I will move to, Thank you, David. to questions now. Thank you, Victoria. Um, we have another question for for UNICEF. Um, the question is just give me a second, let me see. Um, Africa youth suffer because of lack of ICT technology, especially those in the remote area. What should we do about this? Um, okay, thank you for the, that question and many excellent questions. I've been trying to respond to some of them in the chat box, so please do see some of my comments to your questions, because I know we're not going to get the time to answer all of them. But the question uh, David has picked out is one of the most important ones. Uh, I, you know, so one of the in one of the comments, what, one of the things we've been looking at is what the data that we have about what technology exists at household level. Most interestingly, the mobile phone is the is the most prevalent technology. And here I'm talking about Eastern and Southern Africa. How we may be able to nuance it for Western and Central Africa, but it's about at 70 to 80 percent of households across Africa. And so we're talking about countries from Eritrea, South Sudan, and Somalia, with very low technological penetration, all the way to South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia, the upper middle income countries. But approximately 70 to 80% of households have a mobile phone. Um, one of the things that we've been encouraging our partners, our governments, to really think through is how do you use that? How can you build communication trees to start sending messages uh, through the system, down to parents, down to students, by SMS and calls? Uh, maybe that's the most powerful at this stage. And what are the messages that you want to be saying at this stage? There needs to be a lot, and I think we heard it from the last speaker, a lot that addresses uh, psychosocial issues around reassurance. We, we're not going to be overloading. There was a question about levels of literacy. We do not need to be overloading parents with complex, especially where no literacy exists, where no technology is the reality, with complex lesson plans. It's got to be about uh, uh, encouraging um, parents to feel like they are going to be doing the right thing for their kids just by looking after them, looking after their needs, uh, uh, helping encouraging them through basic uh, stimulation, um, giving them the space to try and do what learning that they can do, but not over them. So, so the, but the mobile phone seems to be really interesting, but then a lot of what a lot of governments are doing is TV programs, radio programs. Um, this has less penetration at household level, um, so it continues to be a challenge. Um, there, there are and this is a, a, a real challenge, there, there is going to be a significant proportion of deep rural um, communities that are simply uh, not engaging with learning right now. And we need to then, as my, one of my slides talked about this, we need to understand who they are. So when we do reopen schools, we have a special package for them. And we really understand their needs so they can have an accelerated learning when they come back to school. Thank you so much, Shiraz, for that. Um, I will ask the question to Victoria now, which I think is very interesting. Um, um, does the task force have any capacity mandate support for being inclusive of children and youth with disabilities? That's a really great question, David. Considering that we are activated and operationalized very much informally, we do, as, we do what we can to engage with young people who experience and live with disabilities, but right now I cannot say that we have been meaningfully engaging with that population as much as we could. Um, as one of the core conveners, I think it would be my job to think through how can we make these digital platforms accessible to young people living with disabilities, whether it be um, learning disabilities or physical disabilities, and what we can better we can do better to um, reach their needs. Um, so we have tried to make sure that all of our learning materials and peer support sessions are as accessible as possible. And I know that young people in each of our country chapters, some of them at least, are focusing on engaging more with young people living with disabilities, but we don't have like a 
a baseline guideline or or standardized process for engaging young people living with disabilities. And I absolutely welcome if anyone here in this group has guidance in this area or a toolkit to share, I think that would actually be really helpful um, for us to uptake and adopt and help us implement our activities a bit better in a way that's inclusive. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, I think that, yes, I would be, it would be great to connect uh, with your chat box. So if you have any resource, please send out. Uh, and also, if you want more resources on disability, there are some on the core group website. Uh, I think that it would be great to have to receive also the same answer from UNICEF. Uh, what are your thoughts on, of, on children with disabilities? How we can address the education need for them? So there's a lot happening already um, to ensure that the range of resources that are being made available to support home learning are, um, are inclusive. And that may range from, uh, if it's TV, that there's subtitles and um, uh, sign language. Uh, one of the projects that UNICEF is working with a number of partners, and I put a link in one of my um, ch chat box posts, um, was about the accessible digital textbooks, so uh, where uh, distribution of tablets is possible, uh, is few of our countries, um, that it's possible to, to introduce software that turns any type of educational um, content into accessible content. Um, it, 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 I mean, one of the, the key questions, and it was raised by someone about, you know, you've got to start with the most marginalized is by saying that as you devise the content that you're broadcasting, the calls that you're making, the workbooks that you're printing and distributing, that how is that being done in a way that respects the range of disabilities? Uh, I think one of the challenges that we are very conscious of is that um, uh, there are many disabilities and there are many disabilities that are easier technically to respond to, such as maybe adding sign language or, or, or subtitles to TV programs, compared to much more perhaps intellectual disabilities of which parents may be dealing with many complex home challenges, which are not going to be dealt with by adding a braille version of a workbook. And, 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 uh, and, and I think the reality, again, is, is that we, can we communicate with the parents? Can we reassure them that you know what they're likely to be doing, what their natural um, instincts are going to be, are going to be the right ones, and to be confident in those, and then let's make sure we're ready for them when they come back to school, because there is a reality that gaps are there are gaps in the system currently. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um... So we will move to the next presentation in the interest of time. However, um, there is a chat box. So if you should ask how we and Victoria, if you can respond to some questions uh, over, over the chat box. And also I see that you're sharing already your contact information. So yeah. feel free to, to contact them directly. And also the slides will be posted on the core group website after the, the webinar finishes. And uh, so thank I've been trying to address everyone's we... questions in the chat box as much as possible. Thanks, David. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you very much. Uh, so remember that also we're trying to engage in Twitter. So if you want to respond to this question and you want to tag us using uh, our Twitter hand uh, or Twitter account, which is at Core Group DC, our question is what immediately needs to be done to support children and youth during the COVID-19 response. So feel free to tag us, and Google, we will see this on Twitter also. So the next presentation is from Dr. Natasha Kaoma. She's the CEO of Copper Rose, and she will be uh, Zambia. She will be talking about some of the uh, response activities that they have taken in Zambia. Natasha, please. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. My name is Natasha Salifianji Kaoma, and I'm from Copper Rose, Zambia. I am a medical doctor by training, and I'm also an epidemiologist. I will be sharing some lessons on youth programming during the pandemic. I have noticed from the comments that a lot of people are looking for solutions. So I will be as quick as possible through the presentation and focus more on the solutions so that we can have solutions to go back home with. Um, David, I'm not sure if I can control my I will slide. move the slide. Yeah. I, can, okay. I would move the slide. Okay, yeah. next slide, please. Um, so I'll talk about... Um, 
what part of our work has been affected, I won't focus more on the challenges, but I would like to make recommendations for young people, youth-led and youth-serving organizations. Next slide, please. Hello, next slide. Sorry, there was an announcement in my flat and I had to mute myself or else everyone would hear it. Okay, so Copper Rose um, is an organization that works with young people and our goal is to um, empower young people and women. We work in the thematic areas that I uh, will show on the next slide. This was supposed to be a video, but there were some tech issues, so we'll just go to the next slide. Thanks, David. So um, we work in these four main thematic areas, which is leadership and mentorship, economic empowerment, menstrual health management, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, we have a different approach, which is led by youth and for young people. And our vision is a world in which every woman and young person is happy, healthy, and living to their full potential. So Copper Rose uses a holistic approach which includes in school and out of school young people, including young women. And we focus on behavioral change as well as systematic change in policies and practices towards a more supportive environment for young people and youth-led development. So we work mostly with our volunteers on networks and we support young people to progress in their careers, be champions of youth development, and we also build capacity of other organizations in working with young people in these thematic areas I have highlighted. Next slide. So we work in Zambia at the moment and we work in six um, provinces. And most of our work is around advocacy, service provision. We work on um, leadership development and we have many um, different activities that we do in many of these communities. One thing I will mention is that our approach is different depending on whether we're working with rural young people, or urban young people, because we believe that there is no one size fits all option. In relation to the COVID pandemic, I just want to share a little bit about the Zambia situation, um, just so that you have an idea of what kind of magnitude the, our approaches um, are trying to cater for. Um, so in the previous slide, um, I did show something about the number of cases that we have. As a country, as at yesterday, I must say these slides were made yesterday, 75 cases and three deaths, and um, half of those cases have already recovered. But we are still seeing the impact of the pandemic because a lot of things have been shut down and businesses have come to a halt. Some of the work that, we, we, that has been affected um, um, is our service delivery work. So we do have young people that work as community-based distributors of contraception at their universities and their schools, and these activities are not able to go ahead because of the pandemic. Um, most of the healthcare providers who we work with are also being taken to work in the COVID screening centers at health facilities, because despite the small numbers, we still need to do a lot more screening. And so we're seeing a lot of providers who would have been providing services like family planning, not able to work in these um, facilities. Next slide. We are also being affected with the demand creation activities because the demand creation activities we do around contraception, um, family planning, and even just reaching out to young people with our peer educator models are not able to run with um, the pandemic. We do have girls clubs which we run with girls in schools and mostly these are young adolescents between 10 and 14. We work with these girls because we know that this is the best time to start bringing in information and bringing in um, self-esteem and building and many of the other interventions. But we're not able to do this because most of the girls at that, in that age group have no phones and so we can't reach them, especially the ones in peri-urban areas. Next slide. Um, one thing of note is also that with this pandemic, the supply chain for reproductive health commodities in the private sector and in hard to reach areas has been affected because often if, if the roads are not um, free and people are not able to move, small scale businesses which, are, which usually use public transportation are not able to supply some of these goods. So we're seeing some stockouts at community level in terms of things like condoms, contraceptives, and these things are very um, 
difficult to get to these places and west, we may see a direct impact on reproductive health and teenage pregnancies in the future. There is also limited access to resources generally. A lot of these places, for example, in the Copper Belt, the, some of the biggest mines um, imply a lot of the um, uh, people that we work with. And so because a lot of people are laid off, there is limited access to resources and it's accentuating the disparities, especially for women and youth. We also don't have protective um, equipment, personal protective equipment for our outreach activities. And um, nobody else has said this before, but I just, I must mention that everyone is talking about adaptation, but adaptation costs money. Um, yeah. Next slide. Okay, um, I'd like to um, talk about the general challenges facing young people and youth organizations at the moment. Um, first of all, young people are not being involved in prioritization of services because there are a number of services that are being deprioritized, like access to abortion, access to contraception. Some of these things are considered as not important for young people. So the youth-friendly centers within the hospitals that we work and facilities are closing. While they continue to provide services to the adults, the young people's youth-friendly spaces are being shut down, and this is a big challenge. Also, as an organization, our ways of working have had to evolve very rapidly, and um, this has been both a good and a bad thing because we've literally, if you Google us right now, our website is shut down because we've had to readjust it and so that we can put a lot more things that people can download and just change the way the website works because it's going to serve a lot more um, for information for young people than it, than it used to. So these are some of the um, things that we may float around a lot, but we don't quite understand the intricacies. As Shiraz and the previous speakers mentioned that education is something that may not continue online because a lot of people don't have access to phones. Um, next slide, please. So I want to focus on the recommendations for coping. And um, I will spend a lot of time on this slide just so that I can give um, tangible um, solutions that Copper Rose is using. And I would encourage a lot of people that If you can finish in the next minute, please. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah. you, <laughs> Thank you. So um, the first thing I would like to mention is that we need to take a deep dive into digital media. And a lot of people are doing that, but um, digital media is something that is expensive and some people may not have access to it. Um, there has been recommendations for us to use radio and people are asking, how do you reach hard to reach areas? I would recommend radio. And this is something that we are doing. Uh, radio because for example, in Zambia, 52% of the population have access to radio. It's not a lot of people, but it's still half the population that can be reached with some of the media, and that's a good place to start. Um, according to the if ZICTA, which is our information agency um, reports, they say 83% of people have phones, and about only 40% of those people have 3G and above. So, um, Using digital platforms is great for the people that are in urban areas, but in rural areas, we wouldn't go that far. And with radio, in as much as the percentage is 52%, one radio is counted for a number of people in the household. So I would say that radio is a good place to start in order to read, reach hard to reach areas. Another thing we're doing is that we are tagging along on COVID-related awareness activities. So if people are going out to the government um, institutions are going out to give information on COVID. We are tagging alone and giving information on reproductive health, which we usually do with our young people wearing protective clothing. Another thing we're doing is in this time, we're collecting stories and documenting young people's experiences because a lot of the mental health issues come from feeling alone and feeling anxious. So as we document these stories and communicate with other people through online platforms, it's giving people a chance to feel like they are not alone and also connecting them to other uh, mental health facilities. We have one connection with a psychiatrist who is working with us to get young people to speak to them for free, which is really great. The last thing I would say and I would recommend is that um, there are a lot of funding opportunities, but not a lot of them are taking it into adaptation and modification of programs. Most of the funding opportunities are for new ideas and new things. 
but a lot of those things will need to have had a strong foundation, for example, for education and for many other things. And some of these are not very um, useful. So I also want to say that for youth-led organizations, a lot of us are more like third or fourth in the funding, um, what can I say, food chain. So most youth-led organizations are sub-grantees and they, they sub, the, the person that's granting them also grants to some receives money from some other donor who then receives money from the big foundations. And so what happened is that a lot of the approvals and all those things took really long and a lot of youth-led organizations were not able to jump at the COVID response as quickly as they should have. And I would say if there are donors on this call, um, flexibility in a time like this for youth-led organizations would really go a long way in reaching young people. But um, I think that this is where I will start for now, um, and I will be able to answer some more questions during the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natasha, for the presentation, and thank you so much for raising the issue of funding opportunities for youth organization, because it is really a challenge. Uh, so the next presentation is from Michael Lasudi. Michael is the country coordinator of Organization of African Youth Kenya. Uh, and Michael will be speaking about the solidarity fund, the solidarity for humanity campaign. Sorry, Michael, please let me know when you want me to change the, the slide. Yeah, thank you so much, David, and uh, thank you the group and everyone present. I'm Michael Asundi from Kenya. Uh, so because of time, we we'll just move to the second slide. So I coordinate uh, organization of African youth which is a Pan-African Youth Organization uh, uh, that is headquartered in South Africa, and we have 15 chapters. And um, our focus is on economic empowerment, health and well-being, and also on climate change, but we have gender, leadership, and governance as cross-cutting issues. So we are responding to the COVID uh, outbreak uh, at a national level, also national level, through a campaign that we call Solidarity for Humanity, and uh, this came as a result of uh, the real pandemic that affected uh, people across generations. And also, as you can see, uh, organizations like ILO has already projected around 20 million jobs that will be lost. The next uh, slide. So, Solidarity for Humanity is the campaign that we was conceived by young people at voluntary level that we work with in Kenya and we hope to scale and also with I, the National Youth Alliance, Kenya chapter, and also Kenya Adolescents and Youth SRH network. So we move to the next slide. Okay, so those are some of the tweets that we have engagement, so we move to the next. Yes, thank you. So this, the campaign, the goal is to put young people at the center of the response and also to ensure that they are meaningfully engaged uh, from the beginning and looking at also addressing the issue around the negative impacts of COVID, not only from the health, but also around issues around well-being. So the objective, some of this we are looking at, how really do we tap on or harness the power and the skills of young people, adolescents and youth, also to offer their resource and in response, skills and time that they have. And then also, how do we now push for the local uh, civil societies organization also to complement government efforts? And then using the various agencies of young people, not only the ones serving in the civil society space, but also even the private sector, and also the young people involved in the response as health workers, to mobilize them also to, to respond but also to build evidence on the, the roles of young people in mitigating the impact. And then our other objective is to really generate recommendations for the government. This was also in response to the challenge from the Ministry of Health on what is the role of young people in the response. And then the last one is a psychosocial support for most young people who are not only affected because of loss of income, but also issues around stigmas also within the community. So next. So next slide, Devin. So this campaign has three pillars. Uh, is health and well-being, and also livelihood and resilience. 
and uh, humanitarian support. So we realized that uh, yes, COVID has health impact, but also the issues around well-being, where we are also getting mental health that has been discussed a lot. Then many young people who mainly work in, in informal settlements, many young people work as volunteers or in short-term contracts, their livelihood have been affected. And we have lockdowns across Africa. Then how now do we ensure so that the young people support the government response to offer humanitarian assistance? So our focus of this campaign is really looking at um, young people also um, directing and also driving the conversation on how they can be engaged under the government response and then sharing the information and getting feedback. So we realize that a lot of uh, strategic communication challenges where most of the information from government were not maybe relating to young people and they could not also get uh, feedback from the government. So we are currently in the Ministry of Health Technical uh, Committee for Youth and through that we are able to get information and also share feedback. But we are also running a, a survey to gather evidence on how this COVID has affected young people and then the livelihoods, which is a big challenge for many young people currently. And then uh, the other focus is supporting government efforts and also ensuring the continuation of the social services, which has been raised. So services like maternal health services, uh, like um, uh, people accessing RRV has also been uh, noted. So this is not only a campaign that is youth for you, but how can youth respond to save humanity? So that solidarity that built around. So we want really to harness the power of young people for them, not only as vulnerable people, but also as people who can support. But evidence has shown that uh, I think the elderly are more affected in as much as also young people. So next slide. So, uh, we are proposing uh, a campaign that has um, uh, three uh, focus areas. So one, how can young people respond to ensure stoppage of the spread of the disease, ensuring that we have continuity of supplies and also access to information? And then how do we ensure that the normal lives are, are, are restored in the midterm and long term? Do we ensure inclusivity and also ensuring socioeconomic recovery of young people? So next slide. So, as I mentioned, Michael, the... can I ask you to please finish uh, with this slide, please, so we can have some discussion also. Okay. So we move to the next because I've talked about that. Uh, so this is how far we've already uh, gathered a survey online, and most of the evidence that we are getting is the same as what was shared by Victoria, and then. Um, We've engaged in a three Twitter chat and one was focusing on people with disability, where we gather very vital information and then we have also been sharing. So next one, David. Uh, so like that other photo was shared by uh, young people work with uh, people with disability from Kisumu, that some of the responses are not really responsive to the needs of, of, of young people with disability. So next. So some of the critical issues that we've identified is one on information overload, where there's a lot of information uh, that young people may not even take time to synthesize. Then really, uh, what really, how do we uh, look at um, maintaining the social solidarity of young people? Because young people really love being together. And then issues around economic strain and then mental health and the role of young people in mobilization. So next one, that should be, I think, the last. Yes, so uh, these are some of the areas of partnership that we are looking for, communication, uh, support, and then support in uh, information sharing. And then from the people with disability, they have requested a lot of translation and transcription of information that people with even visual and sharing impairments can also access. And then um, continuity of supplies of essential services, especially food for those who are in the lockdown, and uh, around media engagement. So those are some of the issues that we've gathered. Uh, and there's a lot of fear of young people on how their, their, their mental health will be affected by the loss of life and then also the loss of economic income. 
So I think, David, in summary, that is what you are doing under the Solidarity for Humanity campaign. And we plan to scale this across Africa through the other organization of Africa Youth Chapter. Thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation and for your amazing work. What well, as Natasha, great, great initiatives on the, on the local level. Uh, so we'll address some, quest some questions now. Uh, I know that we um, are supposed to wrap up in four minutes. However, we will ask you to stay in the line for more for 10 more minutes if you are able to. If not, uh, I hope that you have um, some contact information on the chat box if you want to reach out for more questions. So I have a question for Natasha about the, the point that I raised about funding opportunities. And the question is, uh, how um, how do you think that large youth-serving organizations can support youth-led networks to address this concern about funding? Um, that's a very difficult question, Daniel, because um, I, I don't want to say this and sugarcoat it, just so I can sound great on this call, but I want to give a tangible um, um, response. I must say that a lot of organizations are facing challenges during this time. Um, as an organization that cooperates ourselves and some of our partners and colleagues, we are seeing a reduction in the funding ourselves. We've lost some funds, especially from corporate companies. Um, some organizations have gotten, not from cooperates, but from other organizations, they've literally gotten their grants back because the sub-granting organization needs that money for their own work and sustenance. So um, it's quite a difficult time in terms of how large organizations can help young organizations because some of them are trying to swim themselves. But some of the tangible solutions would be to support them in terms of resource mobilization for further resources because with the resources they have, they may not be able to uh, work with them. Other ways to do non-cost partnerships where um, you are partnering and you are still working on things together, but you are not able to um, um, support the finances, but that's not realistic because people need money. Also, um, I think that writing like letters and appeals to donors to be more flexible with funds, because for some organizations, there is already funding available. Maybe it was supposed to be for something else, but asking to redirect that funding for youth responses, that may be um, a good um, um, idea uh, in terms of resource mobilization. There are a number of grants that have come up um, right now to respond to COVID, although most of them are small, but what larger organizations can do is build capacity or help and strengthen the ability to compete for those available funds. That's, I think, is some of the tangible um, ways of helping each other in a time like this one. And lastly, I did watch a video which was by one of the global um, NGO directors. And he was saying that the COVID is a, also a good time for mergers because um, with the shrinking funding, um, this could be a time to merge organizations and start focusing on the same thing. So those are some of my thoughts on this. Thank you so much, Natasha. Yeah, I totally agree on the importance of partnerships and um, not duplicating efforts, particularly in the lack of funding that we are navigating right now. Uh, yes, so another question that we have received is, um, is there an organization that has undertaken in-depth study to gather views of youth during the COVID-19 response period? Uh, anyone who has any answer on this? Okay, David, thank you. As I mentioned, uh, our first step of uh, uh, the campaign Solidarity of Humanity was to gather evidence on the impact and how it has affected young people. So we already uh, commissioned a study last uh, two weeks ago and uh, gotten feedback, but it's Kenya focused in uh, through a Google survey and also through WhatsApp and um, also through um, uh, Twitter chats. And our report will be out in, uh, by end of next week, we are now currently doing the data analysis. So we'll, we'll be able to share that, but it's Kenya focused and we plan to scale across Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for that. Yeah, I totally agree that we will need also to have some youth-led research, uh, speaking yeah. from an academic perspective, so we can have the voice of young people also in the met developing methods, find in the findings, in the discussion, and the recommendations, and every part and, and all parts of research. 
uh, totally agreed. And of course, also the, the issues of young people will be raised in this kind of research in a more proactive way. Um, yes, so I think that those are two questions that I had um, on the chat box. Um, in the interest of time, I will ask uh, Julie to, to jump in again so she can mention about the resources that she has found about uh, young youth and, and children. Thank you, David. Third time is a, is a charm for unmuting. Um, I, I just want to thank uh, all of you who, who stayed with us for your wonderful patience. I've really been enjoying uh, following all of the action in the chat box. And a particular thank you to the, the presentations who are, are continuing to answer, answer questions. I just wanted to take a, a minute to touch base on how many wonderful resources we've been able to find um, related directly to children and youth. So what I've done and what you'll be able to pull up from the presentation in terms of these links is highlight some of the, the, the fun uh, resources that we have. There's this great book, My Hero Is You, uh, that is in 25 languages and it's really user friendly and it's got wonderful images. And there's another Kobe book um, that it supports and reassures children, again, in 25 languages. So you've got both a general information and, and then, you know, aspects of helping with uh, psychosocial support. There's then the specific uh, COVID-19 Youth Mental Health Resources Hub, which I found in the team at Core Group found to be really helpful in, in sharing with our, our, our partners. Uh, and then Brain Pop has an extensive menu of multimedia animations and content offerings uh, in the form of movies and, and, and um, other types of animations, really eight or 10 different areas. Um, and it's just very extensive, very impressive on how it, 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 it pulled it all together. And then finally, we just uh, threw in a, a coronavirus uh, comic. Um, I do want to make this point that um, there's been a lot of discussion about people with special needs, uh, especially disabilities, um, and, and, and this, this idea of digital. So I did put in the chat box that we did have two calls on digital resources and digital approaches for COVID. Those are in the, the earlier in the month and, and late last month that um, the calls are there, the presentations are there, and we had rapid fire presentations. So there are many, many resources there. Um, and we're always looking for more. And I think particularly my takeaway today is it's great to have these links and it's great to have these resources and we're happy to share them, but we really need to wrestle with this idea of low, um, low bandwidth, um, low technology areas, villages without electricity, I'm taking that very clearly from the chat box, and that's a challenge that we're going to need to to really think through. So thank you, um, thank you all for um, your participation. Thank you for staying with us, and please visit our website. We're happy to share all of these resources with you. David, I'll turn it over for you if you have any uh, closing comments, and then I think Lisa would like to to say a word before we 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 stop the live portion of the call. Over. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Julie, for sharing those resources. Uh, we welcome also more resources from you. If you have any, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you have the Core Group website, and also uh, you can see what's already uploaded there. Um, so yes, young people are often not taken into consideration in this kind of, uh, of responses, and we have heard from, from the global perspective and also from the local perspective, what are the challenges that people are, are facing, and some solutions also. However, there are some, some issues that are, are beyond our control. For example, funding, which was raised by Natasha, uh, and also, for example, trigger issues, for example, uh, people living with disabilities that was also mentioned in the webinar. So thank you so much for, for joining, and I will just hand over to Lisa now for some closing. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, those are fabulous presentations. Um, really great to hear country voice and youth voice. Um, David, great moderation um, from a youth himself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Julie, thanks so much also. 
Um, I, I welcome you to all um, look at the core group website and the resources, but also um, think about broader participation. And I put um, our um, link to get involved um, with our working groups. Um, please feel free to reach out. Um, I think um, there's a lot that we can do together. Um, and as we search for opportunities that can filter down and go to the country level, um, we will keep all of your groups in mind. Um, there really is power in par partnership and collaboration during this time. And that's one of the things I love about these calls is because you can see some of the um, people that are connecting just in the chat box. Um, you know, we're each week we're bringing in over 150 plus, uh, sometimes up to 300 um, people from around the world. So thank you for all your participation and great questions. And it's great to see so many people um, and friends in the <laughs> chat box. So thank you again. Have a great weekend and stay safe. And viva the youth. Thank you so much, Lisa. We can do a cheer. Have a good day, everyone. Viva the youth. We Thank should. you so much, Viva. you guys. It was great meeting Viva. you all. Viva. 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 All right. Thank bye, you. Guys. Viva. Viva. Bye, bye. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Weekend. Ciao. Bye. You too. Ciao. Bye. Bye.